In the final video of this lecture, we're going to talk about scaling up. Transformers, more than any other type of model, are famous for being big. For some reason, this type of model, trained on natural language, really performs well in the regime of large data and big models. This is true to some extent for other domains and model architectures, but never quite as much as for transformers on natural language. We'll try to look at where this behavior comes from to the extent that we know, and perhaps more importantly, how these big models are actually trained. These plots are from a paper produced by OpenAI. It shows that when we train an autoregressive transformer on natural language data, and we increase the model size, the dataset size, and the amount of compute available in the right proportions, then the performance increases in a very predictable way. The takeaway for a lot of people, at least in this domain, was that so long as this pattern holds, there isn't much value in investing in clever methods. A large transformer trained on more data will always catch up with any clever tricks we come up with. Now, we don't know much about why transformers specifically seem to scale so well with data. In part, it's just that language data is so readily available. Another aspect seems to be the structure of the data, since, for instance, visual transformers don't show quite the same effortless scaling behavior. Here are some more subtle points from the scaling loss paper. The left plot shows that for the same amount of training tokens seen, a larger model gets more performance out of the same data than a smaller model at the cost, of course, of more compute per token. The plot on the right shows that if we increase the amount of compute, the optimal size of model for a given amount of compute changes in a predictable way. Moreover, it's usually better to train a big model to well before the point where it begins to converge than it is to train a smaller model to convergence. So, we don't fully understand why large language models scale so well, but it seems clear that they do. For a large part of our community, this was reason enough to start training some very big models. So how is this done? The models we've been talking about take hundreds of gigabytes to store. So far, we have always assumed that everything about our model fits into memory. The parameters, the optimizer state, and the full computation graph. With these kinds of models, that will no longer be possible. To start with, let's see how far we can get with one modern GPU. The largest GPU that you might commonly encounter at the time of writing is the A100, which has uh, 40 gigabytes of GPU memory. How big a model can we fit into that amount of memory? We'll take GPT-2 as a point of reference. It has 1.5 billion parameters, so it should take about 6 gigabytes to store, assuming that we use 32 bits per parameter. That suggests that we could comfortably store it in memory. However, we also need to store the gradients. This is another 6 gigabytes because it's the same amount of numbers. Next, we need to store the optimizer state, which for Adam requires a momentum term and a second moment term for each parameter. That means that even if we forget about all the intermediate values and the computation graph, we already require 24 gigabytes for a single parameter update. Here are some back-of-the-envelope calculations for how much it takes to store various parts of the model and intermediate values during the forward pass. All of this adds about another 6 gigabytes. For most of these, we also need to store gradients, although PyTorch may be able to delete some of those when all the upstream gradients have been computed. In short, after all this, we'll be lucky if we can run the model for a batch size of 1. Note also that this is a big GPU. In the days when GPT-2 was actually trained, Memory sizes of 12 gigabytes were much more conventional, so training on a single GPU wouldn't have been feasible in this way with a model that size. Before we start bringing in more GPUs, let's see how we can get more mileage out of a single one. One way we can fit more model onto one GPU is to represent each number, the parameters and the intermediate values, in 16 bits rather than 32 bits. At the top here, we see a representation of the 32-bit floating-point representation. This is how decimal numbers are normally represented in computers and on GPUs. It consists of an exponent and a fraction. And there are links in the slide annotations that explain exactly how this works. Now, for most parts of the network, 
it isn't really important to be extremely precise. A value of 0.1 may have broadly the same effect as a value of 0.125. But, due to the way this representation works, a value of 0.125 can actually be represented exactly in a very small number of bits, whereas a value of 0.1 cannot even be exactly represented in 32 bits. The idea is that if we switch to this 16-bit representation, we can represent our numbers slightly less accurately, but the performance doesn't degrade very much, and in return, we can store twice as many numbers. Now you can play around a little bit with how exactly you turn this 32-bit floating point representation into a 16-bit floating point representation, specifically in how, mu how many bits you use for the exponent and how many bits you use for the fraction. We see both being used in practice, and only for very big models do we see much of any difference. Now, when using 16-bit floating-point numbers, there are some important points to pay attention to. First of all, some parts of the network, like the computation of the loss or the computation of nonlinearities, suffer quite badly when they are done in 16 bits. This is why we train in mixed precision. Usually, we do the linear operations in 16 bits and nonlinear operations in 32 bits. That means that all the weights and the intermediate values are in 16 bits and are stored in 16 bits, but for certain operations they are cast up to 32-bit precision before the operation and back down to 16 again after. Since matrix multiplications are almost always the bottleneck in any neural net, we spend most of our time performing the matrix multiplications. We, so we still save a lot of time and memory by performing these in low precision. There are some other things to take care of. First of all, Nonds, not a number, some part of the computation resulting in not a number, are a lot more likely in mixed precision. In full precision, we usually stop our training process if we get a not a number, and maybe change the learning rate or in some other way debug our training process. In mixed precision, if we get a loss that is not a number, we simply skip the batch and move on to the next batch. Finally, the reduced precision may cause some gradients to underflow to zero as they're backpropagating, which causes all upstream gradients after that to become zero as well. The solution is to scale up the loss before starting the backpropagation, and then to scale the gradients back down after they've been computed. In PyTorch, all the necessary adjustments can be made with a few wrappers around the optimizer and the model computation and loss computation. The result is that we use roughly half the memory and that the computations in low precision are also a lot faster. After we switch to mixed precision, we may still be left with the situation that we can only train with very small batches, perhaps of only one or two instances. The problem is that this may lead to very unstable training unless we set a very low learning rate. The solution is very simple. For a concrete example, imagine that we can only train on a single instance at a time in the memory we have, but we would like to use a batch size of 32. Now the gradient over the batch of 32 that we would like to use is just the gradients of all the 32 single instance batches summed or averaged together. This means that we can just collect the gradients over 32 batches in 32 separate forward and backward passes and sum them as we go. The pseudocode here shows how that is done. We initialize our gradients at zero, we loop over the data and compute the gradients. Whenever we compute a gradient, we add it to the gradients we've already computed. And every 32 steps, we take the gradients we've collected, perform an update, and then reset the gradients to zero. Of course, this is much slower than training a smaller model with a single gradient update step for every forward backward. But that is the way we train big models. We trade off compute for memory. Note, however, that some operations make assumptions that are broken by this approach. For example, batch normalization won't work if you have a single instance because it normalizes over the batch dimension and it will work very poorly if you only have a handful of instances. For this reason, large models tend to use layer normalization rather than batch normalization. Finally, here is another way to trade off memory for compute. Let's look at the way we define the operation nodes in our computation graph. Key thing to remember from the second lecture is that we often record intermediate values in the forward pass, because we need them in the backward pass. 
In our model of backpropagation, we used the context object to store parts of the forward computation that we need to reuse during the backward. Now, instead of storing these parts, which uses memory, we can also recompute them. We leave the context object empty, and when we reach the backward for this node, we just rerun the forward up to this node to get the required intermediate values in the context object. This is expensive, but it can also save a lot of memory. Here again, we need to be careful with certain modules, in particular ones that use randomness, like dropout. It's important that they behave exactly the same way when the checkpoint is recomputed as they did in the first place. For this reason, PyTorch has a mechanism for running models using the same random seed that you can use if you want to use gradient checkpointing. That way, the random number generator will produce the same randomness in both the initial run and the checkpointed run. Now, once we've exhausted how much model we can cram into a single GPU, it's time to start looking into training with multiple GPUs. There are several possible configurations for this. We could use a single computer called a node with several GPUs. In this case, we need to communicate internally between the GPUs to coordinate what they're doing over the internal buses of the computer. This allows for relatively quick communication, but we're usually limited to about four to eight GPUs. If we want as many GPUs as money can buy, we'll need to distribute them over different machines. The simplest option is one GPU per machine. In this case, the communication between different training processes goes over the network, which is much slower than in the first case. A final option is to have a network of nodes with multiple GPUs each. This gives us the best of both worlds, fast communication between GPUs that are on the same machine and the opportunity to buy as many GPUs as we want, but it complicates the question of synchronization. If we want to make good use of the high communication speeds between GPUs on the same nodes, we should let them communicate more often than we communicate over the network. We will leave that question to the implementers of distributed training libraries. We will only assume that we have multiple acceleration devices, usually GPUs, each with their own limited memory, and that there is some sort of way of communicating between them. The main question is what data and model code should we give to each device, and how should we communicate between them to end up with one trained model. Communicating between nodes or between GPUs is complicated. We'd like to abstract all of that away as much as possible. Luckily, there are a few primitive operations that we can build everything on top of. The first is called all reduce. It works as follows. We have a bunch of processes working in parallel. And at some point, the all reduce stops all processes retrieves a value from all of them and applies a reduction to the set of values. This is simply an operation that takes a set of values as input and returns a single value computed from them. The reduction is usually a simple operation like taking the sum or the mean. After the reduced value is computed, the same value is given back to each of the processes. With this definition in place, the people who understand GPUs and networking can get to work on implementing it efficiently. A naive way to do this would be to collect all values in a central process, compute the reduction, and distribute it back. But there are many clever ways of making it more efficient for different situations. All reduce is implemented in many libraries for parallel computation like MPI, NCCL, and GLUE. This means that so long as we can frame our method in terms of local computations combined with an occasional all reduce, we can just call one of these libraries to deal with the technical details for us. And we never have to worry much about how networking or GPU interconnects work. For example, here is what an all reduce looks like with taking the mean as the reduction operation. We take the mean over these three outputs, giving us a value of four. And we send that value back to each of the three processes. Note that in practice, the values that we're talking about are often large tensors rather than scalars. But so long as they all have the same size, we can still take the mean of a collection of tensors. Another primitive we will need is all gather. This is essentially an all reduce, where the reduction operation just takes the different values and collects them in a list. This list is then sent out to all processes. Note that unlike the sum or mean all reduced, this operation substantially increases the memory required by each process. 
even if they replace the result of the operation by the value they provided at the start. That is, in a sum all reduce, for the all gather, doing this always replaces one value by n values. This can be important if the values are large tensors. Finally, there is reduce scatter. This is a kind of reverse all gather in that it starts with a list per process and ends with a single value per process. If these are tensors, you can also say that it starts with large tensors and ends up with tensors that are one third the size. The idea is that we reduce over the lists that the processes provide, resulting in a single list. In this example, we use the sum operator to reduce, but any other reduction would work too. We do this by breaking the list up in equal chunks, one for each process. In this example, each chunk consists of just one number. We then apply the reduction to each chunk over all the processes. For example, we sum the numbers in all of the first chunks over all three processes. And the result is then returned to the corresponding process. That is, process one gets the sum of the first chunks, process two gets the sum of the second chunks, and so on. There are more of these primitives used in parallel programming, but these are the only three we will need. With that, we can start looking at a few popular approaches for parallelizing neural network training over different nodes or different GPUs. If the model fits entirely onto a single GPU, possibly just for one batch of one instance, the simplest approach is data parallel training. We simply make n copies of the model, one for each GPU, and then we split the data along the batch dimension. That is, if a given batch has 18 instances and we have three GPUs, we feed the first six to the model on the first GPU, and we feed instances seven to 12 to the model on the second GPU, and we feed instances 13 to 18 to the model on the third GPU. To simplify things, we've assumed here that we have a model containing three transformer blocks. None of the algorithms we discuss are specific to the transformer, and they translate trivially to other architectures, but we'll stick with the transformer to keep things concrete. We perform a forward and backward pass on each GPU in parallel. This is a purely local operation. Each GPU can do its own job without worrying what's happening on the other GPUs. After the backward, we have a set of gradients for the whole model on each GPU. Each GPU has seen different inputs and labels, so these gradients are all different. We then apply the all reduce to the gradients, taking their average over all three copies and distributing this average back to each GPU. This average is the gradient over the whole batch of 18 instances. With the gradients now synchronized, the GPUs can each apply an optimizer step to the weights of their model. Because the weights are synchronized, we know that they will apply exactly the same step, even if they use momentum or atom. In fact, data parallel training, when you do it like this, is provably equivalent to what you would get with a single GPU if it were big enough to fit the whole batch. To achieve data parallel training very simply in PyTorch, you can use the data parallel wrapper. You simply create a model as normal, and feed it to the data parallel class, which acts as a model wrapped around your model. This does several things behind the scenes. First, it creates copies of your model on all available devices. Then, when a forward is called on the data parallel wrapper, it splits the batch and sends each of the pieces to one of the GPUs, so that each copy runs a forward in parallel on a different slice of the data. It then concatenates the results of these different forwards and returns the results of the wrapped model. This is a tensor. This is a tensor here called output that resides on device zero. The rest of the computation of the loss happens on device zero over the whole output batch. The computation graph is constructed over all devices, so it automatically computes gradients for all copies in parallel. After the backward, a special hook registered by the data parallel wrapper, runs the all reduce over the different gradients of the different copies, ensuring that all copies now have the same gradient. All parameters of all copies were registered with the optimizer, so it automatically updates all models. This extreme simplicity in the implementation comes at a cost. To start with, 
It would be more efficient to have each copy compute its own loss on a slice of the target batch as drawn in the previous slides, rather than doing it for all copies on device zero. Moreover, this approach requires multi-threading rather than multi-processing, which is a little broken in Python. Finally, this approach here only works with devices on a single machine. A more versatile and robust approach is the distributed data parallel module, linked in the slide annotations, which also works for multi-node training. However, this also requires more extensive changes to your code, so we won't detail it here. So that is data parallel training. For a model that fits on the GPU, this is likely all you need. It's simple to understand and it's quite efficient. There are two main downsides. One is that it is required to keep a copy of the optimizer state on each GPU. If we're using Momentum SGD, this is a vector that is as big as the model itself. And if we're using Atom, it's two vectors the size of the model. These are guaranteed to be exactly the same on each GPU, which means we're storing a lot of redundant information. The other issue is that the model may not fit on the GPU in its entirety. And in that case, we need to use tricks like checkpointing, which is going to add a lot to the time required for the forward and backward pass. An alternative, if our model is too big to fit on a single GPU, we can split the model and send different parts of it to different devices. This is called model parallelism. This requires a little bit more manual work than data parallelism, because you need to figure out how many blocks can fit on each GPU, and data needs to be transferred manually between them. Here's a simple example of how to achieve model parallelism in PyTorch. We simply create a network as normal, in this case consisting of two linear layers, and we then move each layer to its own device. The first one is called CUDA colon zero, and the second is called CUDA colon one. Then, in the forward, we can simply feed the input to the relevant layers in order, except that we first need to move them to the correct device. We get X, we move X, to device zero, and then we feed it to layer A, which is on device zero. We apply a nonlinearity, and then the result we first move to device one, and then we send it to layer B, which is on device one. PyTorch will do the rest and happily keep track of the computation graph over multiple GPUs and run a backward over all the different devices. You can even use this trick to offload parts of the computation graph to the CPU. If there's one small computation that takes a lot of memory and you don't mind it being a bit slow, this might be a good approach. The big problem with model parallelism is that most of the time, the majority of your GPU is doing nothing. While this middle block is executing, GPU one and GPU three are waiting for the execution to finish. It's very wasteful to buy a lot of expensive GPUs and to have all but one of them doing nothing. So can we find something for these idle GPUs to do? At the top here, we see what model parallelism looks like unrolled over time. Note that at all points in time, all but one of our GPUs is idle, i.e. doing nothing. One solution called pipeline parallelism is to note that while GPU is waiting for the backward of one batch to come back, it can get started on the next batch. This can get a little complicated, so it pays to draw who does what over time. One important aspect of pipeline parallelism is that during the backward, the blocks depend on one another in the reverse order. That means that if we get started on batch two while batch one is still in progress, GPU three should take care of batch two first so that we can start the backward on batch two before the backward on batch one. Note also that these are micro batches. That is, we do one gradient update over all three of these batches. At the end, to the right of the figure, all the gradients are summed over all three batches and one gradient step is applied. A great benefit of pipeline parallelism is that for each block, the parameters, the gradients, and the optimizer states for the parameters of that block only need to live on the GPU holding that block. This means that we get no redundant copies of any part of the model or the optimizer. The downside is that even with pipeline parallelism, we cannot avoid a substantial amount of GPU idle time in the middle. This is sometimes called the bubble. We can make the bubble a smaller proportion to the total compute by increasing the number of batches, but we can only do that by seeing more data per single gradient update. We get one bubble for every update we make.
In general, we don't want to reduce the number of updates too much. We usually prefer to make many noisy gradient updates rather than fewer very accurate gradient updates. So one final thing we can try is to split or shard the model as well as the data. This is referred to as fully sharded data parallelism or FSDP. The key is to shard each layer into equal parts. That is, each GPU gets a copy of each layer, but only concerns itself with storing the parameters and gradients of one third of that layer, or one nth if we have n GPUs. We call this the part of the model that is stored persistently. That is, from one forward pass to the next, the GPU keeps these weights in memory and indeed is responsible for remembering these weights. Across the three GPUs, each parameter is stored persistently in exactly one device. If the GPU needs access to the rest of the layer, it retrieves those parameters from the other GPUs. We call this transient storage. The idea is that the GPU is not responsible for these parameters, so it can retrieve them when needed and then delete them afterwards. Another GPU is responsible for them, so they will always be available when needed. How exactly you shard your layers depends on the details of the model. For a standard transformer block, we can note that almost all of the parameters are part of a linear layer, either the feedforward part or in the key query and value projections of the self-attention. For these, we can just slice the weight matrix and bias vector into n chunks, where n is the number of GPUs we have available. That is the key idea, that each GPU maintains the parameters, the gradients, and the optimizer state for only the shard of the layer that it's responsible for. This is what it keeps in memory and updates when the time comes. Of course, to compute the forward and backward, the GPU does need the rest of the parameters and the rest of the gradients. These it retrieves from the other GPUs whenever it's time to compute a forward or a backward for this block. This needs to fit in memory during the computation of the block, but after the forward or backward is computed, we can forget about them again. We only need to retain the parameters, gradients, and optimizer states for our shard of the parameters. So here's a detailed diagram of what that looks like for the first layer. At the start, each GPU contains its own shard of the first layer. The rest of the parameters are unknown. We perform an all gather so that each GPU now has a full copy of the weights of the first layer. Next, we collect the input for each GPU. In the first layer, each GPU gets a slice of the current batch of data. Later in the model, these are the outputs of the previous layers. The key thing to note is that each GPU computes the layer with a different input. This means that they will get different outputs and ultimately different gradients. Note the difference between the parameter tensor and the input and the output tensors. The parameters need to be completed before the forward computation can be done. The input and output are split along a batch dimension, so these do not need to be completed. We can apply the layer to a slice of the input and get a corresponding slice of the output. This is because the computation is independent over the batch dimension. The computation over one instance of the batch does not depend on what the values of the rest of the batch are. That's not the case for any of the dimensions of the parameter tensor. We need to know the whole parameter tensor in order to compute any part of the output. This is why we apply the all gather to the parameters, but not to the input or output. After each GPU has computed its slice of the output, we no longer need the full parameters of the layer. Each GPU deletes all the parts that it is not responsible for and keeps only its own shard, freeing up our memory for the computation of the next layer. We keep going in this way for all the layers. Until we get to the loss, we compute the loss, and then we start the backwards. As the loss propagates, it hits each layer in reverse order to the forward. That means that when we hit the backward for our layer, we can assume that the gradients for our output have already been computed. At the start, we have these, and we have our own shard for the parameters. We need the full parameters for the backwards as well, so we collect these from the other GPUs again. After we've completed the parameters, we can compute the backward. This gives us a full gradient on all of our parameters. All parameters contributed to our shard of the input, so all of them get a gradient. Moreover, these gradients are different for each GPU. Each GPU has seen a different input 
so it gets different gradients. However, ultimately, each GPU should only need to worry about its own shard of the gradients. The rest it should delete. To make this possible, we apply a reduce scatter. We sum or we average the gradients of the first shard of the parameter over all GPUs, and we return this value only to the first GPU. We sum or average the second chunk over all GPUs and return it to the second GPU, and we do the same for the third. At the end of this process, each GPU has what it needs to work out the optimizer state for its shard of the parameters and to perform one gradient update step. That's the basic idea of the FSDP algorithm. Of course, to implement this efficiently, there are some things we need to keep in mind. The first is the memory layout. We want to avoid memory fragmentation and we want to optimize the placement of our data within the GPU memory. The second is that we want to overlap communication and computation. What this means is that a modern computer can very efficiently download data while its GPU is doing something else. These, two, these are not two processes that conflict or interact with each other. Now remember that for a model like GPT-3, if we sum up the parameters, the gradients, and the optimizer state, we come to well over 3.6 terabytes. And all of this data needs to be communicated between all of the GPUs involved for, for every parameter update, for every iteration of FSDP. So communication can take a while, and it's important to set up our algorithms so that while we're waiting for these downloads to finish, the GPUs are computing something useful. Finally, there is the option to use FSDP with hybrid sharding. The idea here is that instead of assigning each parameter to just one GPU, we replicate them over multiple GPUs. So each parameter lives on multiple GPUs and sees different slices of the data. This trades off memory for communication overhead. Finally, a note on when exactly you can expect to need any of this. Mixed precision is pretty much always a good idea. The only reason not to use it is if you have an unusual model that doesn't respond well to it, but this doesn't happen very often, or if you're building a very small proof of concept and it's not worth the very minor implementation hassle. Gradient accumulation is a useful trick. If your model is small enough for a large batch size, you won't need it, but otherwise it's a good trick to keep in mind when your training appears to become unstable. It's a costly trade-off and there are better ways of stabilizing learning, but accumulating over a few batches should at least help to diagnose the problem. And if this helps, you can then look into more efficient ways of achieving the same effect. Gradient checkpointing is probably not likely to be useful. It can be helpful if your model falls just short of fitting on a GPU, but if that happens, you'll probably need multiple GPUs anyway to feed it enough data, so you might as well skip to full-blown FSDP. Data parallelism is relatively likely to crop up. You may well need it to train models that fit into memory in principle, but that would still take too long to train on a single GPU. As we saw, DP is very easy to achieve in PyTorch, and data parallelism over multiple nodes is only a little bit more complex. Finally, FSDP. As we noted, this is only necessary if we're training something that is so big it won't fit into GPU memory. If that is the case, you will also need vast amounts of data and a substantial cluster. This means you should also have a team of people working out exactly how best to train the model and how to tune each component of the FSDP implementation to squeeze the maximum throughput out of your training. In short, if you end up using FSDP, you are likely going to need a lot more detailed knowledge than this course can offer. However, it's important for all deep learning practitioners to understand the basic idea behind the algorithm and the considerations that went into its design. So here is the key thing to remember for when you start running into these situations. There is no need to move beyond data parallelism unless you're training very big models. Also, while you can do distributed training in plain PyTorch, for the more complicated setups, it may be good to rely on a high level library so if you find yourself looking into these kinds of techniques, have a look at libraries like PyTorch Lightning, Fairscale, or Hugging Face Accelerate to see if they can make your life a little bit easier.